That's right. They're going to be going to sleep on top of being silent, them crickets. This is the BTW RLM 283. Again, remember, it's just not being peaceful and calm and just thinking everything's okay. It's trying to get out there and doing something, but not doing it right. Or at least more correct. And this becomes another problem is how do you know? And so, as I've been discussing behind the woodshed, you start making certain standardized approaches so that you understand what's gone on so you can analyze, make the analysis of whether or not it's uh, to continue to go on or we have to make adjustments. For those of you that are not doing much of anything, well, I don't know what to say. Then you don't have to make this. I guess you're free to be the cricket. You're free to be oppressed because that's what happens. It, somehow this uh, world, we were lulled into believing we could just let someone else do it for us. And that's not actually how it all works out correctly. They did that to you so that you wouldn't respond, that you would be the cricket, whether that was in actually don't act or doing it wrong. And what do we say by doing it wrong is stepping into the the authority that is around us, the cage they built us, and essentially just taking your uh, your tin cup and slamming it across the bars, because that's what you thought was the right thing to do. So here I am quiet again. It's nice to look around and see lots of people think there's lots of things they get to do, and there's really not a whole lot that is out there. It was an interesting conversation I had with a friend of mine bringing up some old information from somebody else who focused in on the UCC, and but then realized what I had been talking about and said, well, you talked all about this, but in this other way. I said, that's right. All your, all your so-called jurisdictions of law, or not, whatever you think those are, they all have a thread. And if you learn that thread, you can go from one jurisdiction, one authority to the next. The point was, he found within someone else's work done a long time ago, the essence of what I keep telling you all here. What's come up in the last this last week? Well, a couple weeks, actually. And I appreciate, listen, everyone that's sending me emails on what you're doing and what you need to do and what to do, I I can't appreciate that more, and I, and I want to see more of that going on. It's uh, been encouraging a bit to see people finding, maybe start, maybe you're finding finding out you do need to step up someplace. And there's been more, more interaction. Uh, some of the problem, though, is a general, uh, the, a general problem. I, I speak about it all the time, and I wanted to address something here before we move on to the tabs, just quickly as a pointer about what I say. I, I realized, and it's difficult in, the, in, the, in writing in emails as well, likely impossible in chats. I, I don't even know if I can function in the chats, actually, with what I do or what I want to convey or what I want, would like people to know. And no, I don't have much time to take a break in my mind. If someone said, well, we'll go take a break, I, where would I go? I don't get away from my mind. And it works on these problems all the time. Uh, was when I'm talking or typing or making comments, sometimes I, I realize, and I have no way to differentiate this, I'm talking in what you need to know and I tell you to put in your hip pocket. And I also will talk in the same in the same discussion of the things you need to actually say. And I don't make a differentiation in that. I don't do that here. You have to listen close enough to understand that distinct those distinctions. I can't go through in my mind and discuss this stuff as fast as it comes out to tell you and make the delineations. Well, this is what you stick, stick in your hip pocket as knowledge and you don't tell anybody, but this is then what you then can work and do and needs to be put on the piece of the paper or whatever, the communi oral community, the word in your mouth, the oral communication. And so, again, I, I say BYOB, bring your own brain. No, don't bring your own bottle or booze, whatever. Bring your own brain. It, it really takes the engagement. And a lot of people don't understand me, I'm sure. Uh, they don't quite get what I'm doing. Uh, that what I've developed, why I've developed is more important. And that's what I got into my friend, talking with my friend the other last couple of days. Uh, the, there's a real history behind what I do. Why I'm here saying what I say. It's not just some ideas out there. I've tossed away, as useless to most everybody, and certainly myself, most everything I see people using anymore uh, around in trying to stop this thing that they know is hurting them or others. And because of this condition, it's literally the prison you live in. It's the transparent prison you don't see. In dealing with those that are the gatekeepers or the controllers, the decision makers within that structure, they can be dealt with just to a the limited 
The extent is where they are the absolute criminal. And even then they can be dealt with. But at some point you still you have to get to that point to understand what's really going on. But if you attempt to do anything other than this construct that is around you, like we, you know, the Matrix is not a movie. Well, there's a different style of construct around you. It's just as transparent to you as most of you as I, I can uh, I can't uh, explain, explain it any better than than to tell it to you because you won't see it until you engage it. When you engage it, you're going to engage it likely incorrectly. And I don't say that with any uh, arrogance. It's you. I've done my own mistakes. Uh, and everyone that continues pounding on the walls uh, or, or taking that tin cup and ringing, moving it across the, the bars is, is, is the cricket is doing that. You're looking for the next thing that looks like a success. You're looking for the next guy to be the video that says, oh, look what I got over on the judge. And you don't realize the judge is just waiting for you to be done. You didn't do it. There's certain things that maybe that one judge is new on and didn't understand how to answer you. They will go in the back room, so to speak, and they will be to explain to you how to deal with you. And what they end up doing is just denying you. But it's not because you're right. It's because they've got the system under it. They can't expose it to the rest. And so my approach is to go through the most legitimate actions. And the most legitimate actions you can take is to take their own standard and work it the way it's supposed to work and understand they're, they're rec actually having to recognize things and unless it's a criminal, and then you have to deal with a criminal. It's a different issue. So I want to touch base on something I've noticed coming through. I told everybody about this idea, the system in the, called in the state, the system that they've fabricated around you, has a certain way that it treats people. And we've heard it all around. We've seen lots of things. They call it the straw man. They call it identified with all capitalized names and all this other stuff. Well, back in the 90s, People started to identify this, so it wasn't as clearly seen you know, in the corporate state and all this and, and such. They, they tried to stop the pain. They tried to say, I'm different and distinct. And I've, been, I've explained this before, but it doesn't seem that people are listening quite as tightly as they need to to understand what I'm saying. There's a system that's been put up around you that deals its own communication lines. You, you to interact, because you will be interacted with, you need to understand what those communication lines are. You also need to know what needed to be addressed and recognized in you as vested. And you need to be able to keep all that knowledge in your hip pocket. In other words, you're never going to talk about all the stuff you know about how you know what you're doing. You just start doing things. So I've seen a lot of people come up with uh, wanting... Uh, when I said you can prove a negative by showing this entity that they name as you which you identify as all caps, and I've just found another, another uh, someone else brought forward the idea that one of the states uh, doesn't use all caps. And I, I said, okay, good, There's a, a, that's a new, a new one. They don't use all the caps. Now what do you do, folks? Well, they use all lowercase. Okay, so fine, Let's, we don't have to worry about the case then. What I wanted to uh, focus you on is you're looking at not what you do, like it's a silver bullet, you're looking at a function. You're looking at identifying a function and then speaking to that. And the function that this, this state does, those things in the state, and there's actually two definitional differences between those two phrases, this state and the state. However, you identify those. It functions and it represents itself in certain ways. It interacts with certain certain ways. And then they've taken men and women and they tossed them in and made them, made them these artificial entities, which we have now heard as straw men. Yes, they do that and they don't do that. It depends on the condition. It also depends on how you approach it. And so it was a long time ago that people wanted to make a distinction between I'm not that legal entity. And this is the thing about the lowercase name in a state. You go Secretary of State, there was no capital letter designation return on the search. What do we do? Well, we look at the fact that it's still an entity in the state as registered with the Secretary of State, which is a Commerce Secretary for the state, whatever state that is. And so that's the identity. But you're not that. The problem has become, and I'm noticing, people are getting fixated on trying to not be what they are uh, in face of, a, of, a, of an authority. They're, they're trying to promote that which they are as if the statement of that is the silver bullet. But in fact, the subject matter that you're addressing when you, when you produce an evidence of a fraud is to say that there is no entity that can be used against you. 
At that point, and this is the subtlety that I think people are missing, you are irrelevant. Now, I see so many people trying to give themselves adjectives of who they are, what what kind of a man they is, sentient, red-blooded, this, that, and the other, that and a status as well, that you're missing the point. And I needed to call this out because lots of people are starting to do this. And I don't know where this came from, and it's not what I've been, helping, I've been saying to, to help you along. I just said you, the man or woman, whatever your adjectives might be in your own mind, are irrelevant. So why would you then answer your, answer that, those statuses that you've made up for yourself into a jurisdiction that can't see them or hear them anyway when what you're dealing with is a fraud on you that's being used in that, in that authority to harm you? So before I go I mean, longer on this than I need to, actually, I've been going on and on about how we try to get at this problem. When you prove the negative that the legal entity is, isn't even in the state, the problem now becomes not you and your adjectives and what you call yourself, what kind of a man or woman you might be. It's that there's a fraud against you. And you focus on that. And you focus on a judge or whoever the decision maker is to identify in that identification. They will, and this has come up in quite a few more places, and this is a, the interesting problem. When you don't focus on what you're there for and you focus on you, you're going you're gonna to blow it. When they call you names after you've said you have a status, they've just retitled you and you have no way to disprove it. And they're the to see the decision. If you say the name they're using is a fraud, and they're utilizing a fraud to help the state, which is not impartial in a position of judiciary, you now start establishing a fiduciary breach in the judge as well. I don't care what I am as an adjective. I, I care that someone's using a fraud against me. And I can identify that as the name that they're using and show that that's not even a legal entity in the state for which they can use. Now, in, in the courts that are just, they will then, and you're listening for this, it's all, a, switch, it's all a, a transfer of burdens is all this is. As soon as you have make the claim and prove that that name doesn't exist, there should not be an input from the judge. The judge all has to just go over and say, okay, the complainer, the complainant, the state now has to show some other evidence to refute the fact of the evidence you just said that they didn't, they're using a fraudulent name to harm you and throw in the harm. Instead of trying to come back and say, well, I'm this other kind of identity, and then they give you another title which you can't prove against because they're the decision. You focus on the harm and the fraud. You don't focus on you. And I see so many people trying to show how much, uh, what type of man they are to try and make a distinction. And that's irrelevant because they're dealing with a fraud that's harming a man. And the other thing that's now come up, and uh, it is, this is one in an email that just came recently. When you use all those phrases that were, people came up with in the 90s to try and show the distinction they were against the system that was oppressing them, and they weren't in that system, those groups of people became now known as sovereign citizens by the government. By the, they, will na they will label you that. Now, they will also label you a freeman. And that's, that's another type of a problem. And they've changed the context. And so you've got two, essentially two oxymorons that you can claim as a response, not who you are, not in addressing the claim, but in addressing the fact that when they used that name, they didn't have any evidence, and they used it to evade the duty that the court, if it was sitting impartially, was to deal with the fraud that it now knows. Again, I'm not even, you're not talking about you, you're talking about the fraud and how the judge or whoever the decision maker has made a decision to call you a name, defaming you, where instead of shifting the ver burden to the other party to show different or eliminate the problem there because of the fraud. No, now they become partial. And you have to then make the comment. And you can, they can call you that name and you can have, you have the appropriate answer then if you understand what I've been saying. You say, well, what you've just labeled me is defamation. You don't have no evidence. And that's an oxymoron. So you, you're going to call me sovereign citizen, that's an oxymoron. Why are they doing that? Well, they, if they do that, they label you as a domestic terrorist, and they don't have to listen to you no more. If you say, rephrase the status that you've claimed for yourself, 
instead of focusing on the fraud and then the continuation and the aiding and abetting of that fraud by calling you a name, you miss the whole point. And this can be done in writing too. This isn't sometimes the interactions happen in writing, just like this. They will call you this. They will throw this thing out now. They've, the system has learned to put titles on y'all. And you then focus on, well, you argue with someone who has the final seat, seat of decision and say. That's not going to be an argument you're going to win. You have to out the fraud and out the aiding and abetting of the fraud and out the fiduciary breach and not providing lawful due process when the evidence of a fraud was brought before the, the judge so-called at that point. Now, how another thing is once you brought the fraud out, it's not about you anyway. How do they have jurisdiction to tell you anything? If the court, the court jurisdiction, lawful jurisdiction, cannot be invoked by a fraud. And so you start engaging this um, use of utility. You continue the, juris, the fraudulent jurisdiction. You don't challenge that jurisdiction on the fraud. So focusing on you is the wrong point here. Focusing on you trying to state that you're different is the wrong point. The point of the court of the imposition of the jurisdiction or the invocation of the jurisdiction is on the petition, not about you. And if it's on the complainant petition or mo it will be a petition for complaint, then you have to focus on that. And so there's a, been a, there's a big disconnect somehow between what I'm saying and what you need to do. The information you need to hold back in your, in your, in your hip pocket and then what you have to say. And then how you implement the condition uh, against you has nothing to do with you. It has to do with the, the one who's committing the crimes. And it could be more than one. Once you identify that you're not, you say there's no evidence to substantiate a claim of sovereign citizen, but that also breached the due process. When you knew there was a fraud and you didn't deal with the fraud against me to harm me, then you have the condition of a due process violation and a potential, if you want to go there, you have the potential to go to a, what's it called, the um, a judicial complaint against the judge. Now, those aren't necessarily, any of this stuff is not necessarily really effective, but you can use that that as a tool to expose that they're using a term and trying to label you to evade justice, obstruct justice. So you start building a record that they keep telling you. When you're up against this formidable foe that is, is your enemy, and it, in, it appears to be the court system, or it appears to be a code enforcement officer, or other bureaucrat. You have to have these tools to to address, otherwise you will be uh, dealt with. So any of you that want to take this on, you have to understand what I'm saying here. The knowledge of what I just tell you, the condition and the dynamic, is not something you tell them. It's what you understand you're having. It's the wash machine you're in, and you're trying to figure out how to get out of it. And the way you avoid it is just to uh, to impugn the, the 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 paper invoking it by some measure, and those are all done pre-plea. When you try to do that pre-plea, and someone calls you a name, that's an evasion of due process and justice, obstruction of justice. Especially if there's no evidence on the record, you call that out. Let me get to the Freeman designation. That's an oxymoron too, but it's in context of a condition. The word Freeman is not in its own an oxymoron, but in context of the fact that the power who has them before you or will come and track you down is there and exists, or the judge you happen to be before, whether wherever you are in the courtroom, before the bar, after the bar, in the walls with the chandeliers, I don't care where you stand, you're there, and they've got jurisdiction by that paper in that, in that document that you haven't yet refuted correctly. There's a fraud to get you there and harming you, divide, uh, farming, uh, harming you and your rights or property, which is felony in the state. That's another thing you can bring as a response. It's not an argument. It's a statement of countering what the official non-impartial authority in the black robe is attempting to do. You have the statement of the harm uh, by this method, artif scheme and artifice, to use this name. They come back, I know you're a freeman. Well, if you, that's a, I would object, that's a, a, no evidence of that. I'm standing here. That I'm having to stand here under the threat of your uh, enforcement means I'm not a freeman. By definition. And so a, a trier of fact, so-called, in a black robe, 
or a code enforcement officer who brings these labels on you, you need to address that point, not restate what you think you are in adjectives. I hope people are, I hope you follow, those of you who are listening here, I hope you're following what I'm saying. It's not about you. If you're innocent, it's not about you. It's about what's harming you and how, what word do you have in your mouth to describe that? And to not describe it will get you in the trouble that you get. Because why? There is a power out there. I don't know about these people that want to talk about all the stuff that they think they're avoiding by doing whatever they're doing when someone has the right anymore just to shoot you right there on the spot. And so for those of you that find yourself in some trouble and you try to go look on the Internet and you find out all these ideas, understand the condition that that's being spoken through and who might be talking about it and why they might be talking about it. And look at the source of what they're doing. Oh, it looks great. Well, look at the dynamic in the system that they're putting it in. Is that still function? Lots of times I can predict where something's going to go because I can just look and see, well, the system's going to take this and they have answers for all this or they don't. If they have answers for this, I can tell you pretty quickly how it's going to end. If they don't, then we put that what they don't know through the filter analysis of what is supposed to be if justice was intended. And if it's irrelevant to that, then it's not going to work. And so it's pretty easy to pare down what needs to happen and what's going to happen. And so when you come into an authority uh, that has the power to harm you or put you in a cage or whatever, and you don't address that power correctly. And it's interesting, because if you have the ability to address the power, then there's a limit to it. What you got to do is find out what that is and speak there, not on what you think you need to. Speak where it actually functions. And that's in, it's irrelevant to any harm that they do to you when you try to, except that that harm they do becomes another cause, proving what your point was. And so, as I say, you build your evidence of the ongoing harm. You, you show it's real, literally what we all know. It's essentially futile in that system. But you can't just say it by your opinion. You have to develop the record that shows it. And it's not that hard. Those of you coming in want to show that the name is a, a fraud, and you want to bring a, a literally, it's essentially, if you, if you, well, it's not literally because it's not really, it's a fraud. So there's not really a, a, a neg- proving a negative but you're proving the negative and they want to uh, argue that, you can't. You are not part of that. Who you are, I'm a free, sentient, red-blooded, flesh-and-blood man or woman, is irrelevant to the fact of the fraud. Now, so, anyway, there's, um, I don't know what else I can say unless you're involved and engaged uh, to see this. Uh, I'm, I'm asking you all to be very careful on what you see on the Internet about what you think uh, sounds really cool tries to make that distinction. I've told you, you have to be something different than them, but you're not going to get at it by arguing with someone who has the ultimate power of final decision with what he or she has just labeled you with by arguing contrary to that. That sets no good record. You turn that around as a crime against you to evade justice or obstruct justice and to aid in a bed of fraud that's been done by this by the state that that officer sits to be supposedly impartial. You just identified a whole bunch of stuff. And I didn't have to talk about myself at all when I'm doing that. And I don't have to get all frothy about it and just, you know, and scream and yell at them. I just say, you just don't, I object, you violated due process here, here, here. You're, extra, uh, you're working uh, to aid in a bed of fraud, uh, the evidence of which is this paper right here by the state of Secretary of State's own, own, own uh, decertification. Now, that position, to my mind, is a whole lot better uh, than to walk in and try and argue with a, a black-robed one who's just going to uh, find against you and then continue the problem. And when they continue the problem, you know you didn't solve it. So there's some there's some remedies in that. Once you establish that, now you have some remedies. And um, now I'm bringing up more of an email that I was talking with uh, that kind of culminated a whole bunch of other people doing the same problem. And you have remedies. Once you do that, you, you now make the record to invoke the remedy, which I prefer now the collateral remedy which I've been talking about in the equity remedy against the rights. You know, you establish who you are and how you are different and that, that you now have established that they don't intend to give you justice. That's a whole much, e- much easier argument. Not only that, that becomes a felony, but that's a whole easy, whole lot easier to argue, I mean, excuse me, present, not argue because it's not an argument. You have all the facts to show that they have exceeded their authority. 
And you take this oppressor and this occupier and you stick it back in their face what they've done, not because you say so, not because I'm a fresh flesh and blood, red-blooded American, you know, whatever, sentient being, male, I mean, man or woman. No, not because of that, because of all the fraud that they're committing. And you can prove it. Now, let me, let me, as I'm thinking, let me back off just a little bit and go back and say, so you don't tell them all this. This is the knowledge you have. You put this in your hip pocket. What you do tell them is what I said, you, how, you, how you would respond. Why you know to do this, you keep in your back pocket. And I see people confusing this point. You want to tell, some of you want to say, tell the, tell the judge like how much you want to know so you get to your point. No, you don't have to do all that. You don't have to do all that. You just have to find out what it is you need to say and assert that point. And it's not about you. Get yourself out of this. If you're innocent, you're a, you're being victimized. You're being oppressed. You're being violated. You're being harmed. You speak to the action that is doing that. Once you've established, in this case, the fraud of the identity that's been fabricated. You understand? I haven't even used the word straw man. What's another reason why I want to don't want to use all these words? Because that's what the FBI has done to call you all domestic terrorists. You start using all that language, and they will identify you as a terrorist. And now you have the added burden of going back through, almost forced to do an equity case, to prove that you enjoin that imposition upon you. And now you've got a double amount of work to do. Because now you've got to almost prove the fact of your point, because why now you're, you have the burden. It's your complaint. No, I'm not saying that you can't. Actually, the same argument moves forward the same way, but you have to develop it against the assertion, which sits, when they assert, make the assertion, they have a better a leverage than you. And so you, 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 go, you step in the wrong, wrong direction, and you're going to have a little bit of backtracking to do. It's a lot more work. Do you tell them everything I've just told you? No, you just go after the facts of the, of the points that they've done and you assert that against what they ought to have done. And where do you find that? Those hideous rules that they're supposed to follow. The statutes, the codes, the, the law, whatever you want to call it. You bring that up and say, this is what this due process was said to have been this, and you violated that. And you don't have to go on and on. I don't have to pre preach the whole Constitution about that. That's what due process has been developed, and it's been distilled down to today for us. Good, bad, or indifferent, that's what you have. And if you avoid and evade that, you're going to be treated pretty pretty deftly without an ability to respond. And that's my problem with a lot of this. I said there's no jeopardy. Well, there's always going to be a jeopardy when you have an adversary, but you can at least stay armored and shielded up. You don't walk in there and get thrashed without any defense or creating more as they move, and that starts to teach them something as well. You start coming back with the better answer. You don't worry about yourself so much being attacked. You say you start pointing out the victimization that they're creating by the failure to follow the objective basis that we call due process. And now you've got them in a wholly different condition. Now, when I've adjusted all myself over these decades to do these things, we get to the point when they can't really move forward and they really can't give you an answer. And there's really no answer to give. The answer is in their delay. And that becomes actionable too. And so as I've been saying, right now we're in a bad way. We the people are in a bad way. Until we all start organizing up in our mind about what we know we are and what we're up against and start really speaking in the same ways that we can then not get accused and defamed uh, and not have and we have an, a word in our mouth against that and we start to answer back correctly and we get a massive amount of record to do this until we start to do that I think we're going to have uh, more trouble but we'll have the trouble we have now, as I've said this before I've said this over and over, I don't think I've really I get and think about my stuff I don't think I've told you anything. They've never had to really adjust what I've told you all. What I have to do is try to clarify what I'm saying so you all understand what I'm saying. Uh, I speak in two, actually multiple levels, but one I'm speaking about what you do, and the other point I'm saying, this is what you have to know of what you do. And the stuff you have to know, you put in your hip, you put in your hip pocket. The stuff you have to do, you have to parse out what it is you need to do, and that's on a case-by-case -case basis. There is no, I'm telling you, there's no silver bullet, but there is a method once faced with a a problem 
within the system of it because they have you. There's a way to deal with each one of those if you just listen to what's going on. Focus on the correct thing. So you establish, and you're just to let this see if I can clear this up maybe, you establish simply that you're a man. That's all. And then you show that the name that they're using is a fraud. That's your focus now. It's irrelevant about who you are, what you are, the adjectives. They, the burden, if it was a lawful due process, and this is how you start to identify if they're going to give it to you or not, and this is if it doesn't, then you have another statement. Lawful due process, as soon as you challenge with a fraud with evidence, you have provide the evidence, and it's the Secretary of State, that's all them speaking against their own system at that point now. And the judge does not move that burden over to the prosecutor. You know you have a problem. And you better start gearing up for the due process violations and the aiding and abetting of the crime under color of authority, which are felonies. And you better have that word in your mouth. Not who you are, not who you think you are, that you think is superior or, or immune from this, this, this oppression. No one's immune from the oppression. That's why I said Freeman is an oxymoron in context of being before an authority or subject to authority that can harm you or hurt you or compel you in some way. None of us are free that way, and no society will allow us to be free, and that's by definition the big, that's the oxymoron. I don't, I don't care where you go, and I don't care what part of history you go, when you're subject to something, you're not free. And I don't know, when, again, what do I go back to? Cain versus Abel. Cain killing Abel. When you saw that, you said, oh, wow, brothers will kill brothers. Wow, we've got trouble. I'm not free. I'm subject to that. So we might be able to tell ourselves stories and utopias and come up with philosophies on certain isms. There's a reality out there. So for those of you listening to what I'm saying and trying to do what I do, or, or do ex execute upon what I'm saying, understand there's a certain methodology that I've developed in looking at the reality of things. It may not be conducive to a lot of what you all think you, you're, you're looking at, but it works so far for what we're doing in the context of what we're doing it with and how many that we're doing this way. See, there's I've got quite a few things going on anymore that there is a, let's say, a complaint that never gets any further than the clerk obstruction. But the other complaint by the state can go, it does not move forward. It's fairly well a stalemate. On the other hand, we move forward with an equity action to, to, uh, argue, to show that when it did that, that violated the underlying rights under color of authority, those are felonies. No, the equity action doesn't allow you to go after the felony, but it gives you the cause to now petition for someone who they claim in their system has the authority to do that. And you have other laws that you bring to bear that say when you when you continue without prosecuting or directing a prosecute, criminal prosecution, which we don't have available to us, but the system does, and you don't do that, you become aiding and abetting in a criminal fashion as well. And you make that record. That's a whole lot better positioning in my mind than anybody else I've ever heard talk about how to go about doing stuff. Uh, that you just think you can walk into a court and tell them who you are and that's enough or argue with them. Getting them on the wrong side of the objective basis. Whether or not you have the capacity to fulfill it because you live in a prison and the warden is still there. And instead of blaming me for that, you see the failing in you that we all can't stand up against the warden to make the prison break is really kind of another type of oxymoron to blame me while you stand there doing nothing, complaining about the, the fact that the ineffect your ineffectualness in the prison you're going to deny is there. Ought to be some other way. Well, it's not. Reality says it's not. So we got to be getting, starting to deal with reality and not our, our uh, ideas about it. Again, I'm not agreeing with all that. I'm saying that there's a reality. Now, what are we going to do with it? We're going to make stories about it. We're going to tell tales about it. We're going to wax eloquent about all the things that we can identify that's wrong about it. Or we're going to set, figure out what we need to do to stop it and don't get into the traps that are, I think are largely set for us, actually. I told you this a long, long time ago happened to me. I started looking at this back in the 90s. I started noticing... Couldn't tell you they were infiltrators because I wasn't of that mind. I didn't even know. I was so I'm so innocent to this whole nonsense about you know I'm always hoping someone. We're all, always looking and everyone's doing good for each other. 
well, that's I was in, really lost in that because that I didn't realize that's really not the case. Cain will kill Abel, and so when someone's not even your brother, you watch out that you will be set up. And we see it all today. Now it's pretty clear that I started looking very carefully to connect the dots. It's all, it translated very easily over into the mining law and land law of the land titles, chains of title, chain of authorities. How you had to go do? It. I started realizing that there was a whole lot of chains missing, the links missing in the chain with all these so-called patriots talking about a lot of stuff. It could have been an honest thing too. People just wanted the pain to stop, if you will. Well, it never has. But a lot of these uh, bad ideas without actual connections got brought forward. And I learned early on back in the 90s, I, I told myself, be very careful about going on the next fad. Get down to making the connection, to the, make, find every link to a certain process or thought or whatever it is is being brought forward to re, uh, redress these things. And if you can't find it, don't use it. And I've come 30 years, and I think I look back and see what's going on, and I see all the same errors of the 90s doing today because people aren't settled down and not doing that, that I no, don't, I no longer do. And I don't run into the problems I hear lots of you all coming into. On that basis, I continue to move my path and suggest how I, to you all that I, how I get there and how you will start to perform. And I find it very interesting, those that follow more to the T, what I say, and the dot and the chid, tittle, and all that other, oh, excuse me, that was only a three-letter word, though, wasn't it? Oh, no. T -t -l -t -t -l. It's like five or six. Okay. When you follow more of what the guidances are in the objective basis, most of you all are finding out that it's a, an easier path to get where you want to go, even when there's obstructions. Otherwise, you're walking into like a buzzsaw. You don't know what 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 lopped you. What how how did you get your arms lopped off? Because you didn't come at it with a strategic uh, strategy and a tactic that followed some measure of foundation, so you could keep check of where you were. Why was that? Because you never really stepped back to think about what is this thing that I'm up against, and you didn't really listen to the lessons behind the woodshed. You're hearing me, and you're inspired a bit, but you're. You're missing, either I'm not conveying it to you correctly, and this is why I'm taking some time today, or, or you're running rush too hard, too fast. Getting back to the, let me close this off. You want to use the, the, the fact of the fraud being used against you in that state that you identify as whatever name, corporate, whatever. I don't even know what to, it's just, it's an occupier in my mind. Uh, they've set up this condition. It functions in a certain way. It communicates in a certain way. And it presumes you inside that system. And it has the power to keep you there. When you don't learn how to communicate with that thing and those people wielding the machine, the levers of that thing, you can expect a whole lot of pain and suffering, just like Title 42, 1980, USC 1981 says. And they're justified in their doing that. They justify in themselves they're justified. It's all done to your benefit, remember. But when you can expose, not all much all you know, but that you and not that you can explain what that system is and how corrupt it is, but you can explain the function that they do to encounter those without explaining the function side. But do it on the application side, the things you do. You don't wax eloquent about how they're a big corporation violating you. No, you just walk in and you say, what you're doing to me through that method is a fraud. Here's the evidence. Next thing you're listening for, you're not talking. You stop talking right there. Here's the evidence. You're waiting to see what the so-called seated decision might do. And as soon as it goes in the wrong way, you object, call out the violation, and claim the, claim the fact of the crime. You don't even have to blame anybody. You just said... I object going that way will violate due process and because it does this to my rights becomes a felony under the state law. Why do I say it that way? Because that state official is subject to that state law. If they haven't gotten me into the jurisdiction or properly invoked the, the jurisdiction, I'm not in that state law. But I don't have to tell them that. There's nothing there It's irrelevant to that point. Because this whole thing is the invocation of an authority 
We're talking about authority. It's not when they invoke it. It's their authority. And unless you properly address that and forget about who you is, but more of whether or not they've done that invocation correctly, and I don't, I think, isn't it? Anybody who reads, anybody who does common law, wants to read the maxims, knows that fraud vitiates all contracts. Fraud vitiates all authority. That's all I'm using without talking about it. I expose a, a legitimate fraud. Someone wants to call me a name that has the authority to honor that fraud and turn the burden to the person who then declared the fraud in the first place becomes another criminal. I don't care what they are. It's not about me. It doesn't matter whether I'm even a man at that time or a woman. I'm a witness to a crime, and I now have to be able to articulate it. So when you're challenged with these names, you, you put out a whole bunch of stuff, and they say, well, the way you use those words, you're this sovereign citizen. You're a free man on the land. Uh, and then he gets to disregard you. You turn right around and say uh, what I told you earlier in any number of words. That there's no evidence to show that. The FBI says that's a domestic terrorist. You've just defamed me. And you did it in evasion of a, a pre-plea remedy and avoidance, which is to show that there was a fraud in this court. So is this court telling me that it wants to aid and abet this fraud and now felony because under state law, using that as a color of authority to violate my rights to do this is a crime. It's a felony. That's a hypothetical discussion that I just made up that is real when you get to use it. It's, did you hear me talk about me at all? No, I look at the criminals. I look at what they do. I frame the condition to expose the crime. Not accept it. Not to argue over who I am. It's irrelevant. All right. So, 45 minutes. Did I do any good? I don't know. Wasting your board to tears. Everyone's walking away, changing the knob, gun away. Ten minutes of listening. You're done with this stuff. Your life is not a ten-minute broadcast. Turning away from what I'm saying is not going to help. Sticking around for 42 minutes and having questions and not asking is not going to help either. Listening to other people that won't explain some of this stuff is not going to help you either. And what the most important thing will be is that you sit, settle down, you, you take the tidbits of things that you think I, you think you, you hear from me saying, and go research them out, find the foundation for them. So let me finish this off by saying this. Those of you that want to show, and you can show, and prove, that the name they use against you, whether it's in caps or not, now I see, is not the person in the state. And you have evidence of that. There's no further need at that point to talk about and argue what you are, more than what you may have already claimed, which should just, I'm just a man here who's been fraud who has been harmed by this fraud and now let's focus on the fraud is what you're doing you're not explaining why you know the block a capital letter or the legal entity and all that you're not ta talking about any of that you're just exposing that that does not exist and there someone's using it and they called you in and harming you by that you're focused on that so I hope that clarify something. I don't know if I, you know, I keep talking. I don't know what else to say. I don't know how many ways to do this without any feedback. Uh, I don't know what the feedback could be with the, if someone's not involved. Uh, this is not a, this is not a inconsequential concept. Uh, this is not the end all be all concept, but it certainly sets you up to start. If you understand, you start applying, as I'm saying, the way you should, you start to see how this thing works. You start to see what they've done to us. You start to see how they, they take all these these things you do, and they lump them together. They put a label on them, and then they finish you with that. And it's not you just can't say I'm not that. You have to come up now with the reason why it can't be, and then the effect. In this case, oh, it can't be because that term's an oxymoron. So anybody who uses it either doesn't understand that or is trying to use it improperly. But in this case, neither either the, either that it's improperly used or it's a defamation. It's used to evade justice, obstruct justice, because there's a fraud now in the case, and that isn't being addressed. For the officials that omit 
to address that, that's a felony. Is what you're focused on doing. However that turns out, I'm just doing, again, hypotheticals. It'll come out. It'll come out plenty of times. Otherwise, I wouldn't know to say it, actually. So, I think we'll, I hope that's not, I hope that starts to clarify some things here on those of you that are doing this. This is a big deal. Identifying the fraud that they create in the state to use against you is one of the paramount positions. What they've done is when you start using that, they call you some name. And nobody understands what, I, what I've said clearly enough to be able to address that defamation. That maligning of your character when all you were trying to do was a remedy and avoidance, which is your lawful right to do. That becomes the felony when they do that. I don't know why this is such a hard thing to understand. I don't, really don't. It confounds me at some point to even think about this. Maybe it's just because you don't really go read what I tell you to go read. Go find your, uh, your extortion statute in your state. Go find your coercion statute in your state. And go find your conversion statute in your state. And read it out and go tell me whether or not you could fabri uh, not fabricate, you'd be, compile the elements of a felony against you by officials when they take away your pre plea remedies of avoidance to identify also another crime. Not just an avoidance, but you're identifying a crime on the court. A fraud on the court, not the judge, the due process. Fraud on the court, it's not fraud. And anybody who aids and abets that become into, into, becomes a wrongdoer, even if that's the one in the black robe. That's what, I'm not explaining this. I'm just looking for them, looking for the elements when I'm before these guys are in, in paperwork. Are you doing that? So if you're not focused on that, you're not listening to how you have to do this, you can argue with me, but then I don't have a much value in that. You're not helping to clarify how that view is wrong. And you're going to be going into places doesn't matter. It's not just court. You're going to be going into, into places, and it's more like your ego is getting involved. Like someone so told you that if you can sound really, create a high-sounding status for yourself, that that answered everything. When you miss the whole point, that if you're having to answer, you're not free. You're not free from the potential harm that can come from not answering correctly or even engaging. We have our own, I just look at the, like our life is this one oxymoron, one big oxymoron, what we do to ourselves. But at any rate, so I better stop because I'm going to lose. The point is, if you're going to go down and show that the fraud is against you and it's against everyone, you can show that. Everyone can show that. It's not about you then, it's about the fraud against you and what that does within the context of legitimate law, legitimate due process, legitimate remedy. It's an obstruction to all that. That becomes an immediate crime. All you have to understand to do is how to articulate when they did other than the justice that they were obstructing, that becomes a crime against you. And you just identify how they did that obstruction. Okay, so coming in and it doesn't matter how many adjectives you have in front of the type of man or woman you are, stop saying all that. It's irrelevant. Just come in. You can say I'm a man or a woman that's come before the court on a, uh, based on the utility of a fraud against me, here's the proof. And then listen very carefully where the next step goes. And if it doesn't go to address that, then you've got yourself a, a, a criminal in a robe for sure, for fact, no opinion. You don't have to you know, call them all. When they, they, you wait till they act, and then you call that part out. You don't call them a criminal. You lay out the elements to show that they will be if they continue. It's not an argument. It's not a declaration of what you think you are. It's the witness, the appropriate witness of the crime against you. Why? Because that's that system. That's what they're doing now. Why? Because we never start, were told how to do this to out that, and they got away with it. And they're going to continue to get away with it. And where, they, where one of you might prevail, where I may uh, prevail or be all of a sudden stop a lot of things, we're not pushing it through to get the accountability yet. That's really what I'm focusing more and more on, trying to figure out how to get the accountability with only a couple people in the world that understand this stuff uh, to do it right, if, if there's that many, it, it's going to be very, very difficult, if not impossible. So the detractors can continue fulfilling the self-fulfilling statement that it's not going to work by not doing anything correctly, and they'll, what, they'll be right. They'll be absolutely right.
But who's going to be making these decisions soon may be changing, as I've been telling you it's coming. And interesting, uh, more, more and more how this works out in, in our lives uh, about how we do this and what we start to adopt and what I explained to you about the silent weapons for quiet wars and the big electrical circuit you're going to put yourself in and all the devices they have waiting for you to give you all these benefits or the appearance of benefits. And that's really what we're outing, aren't we? And your, ability, your inability to really avoid all that. I told you, listen, I come from the place. I went to the mountains, folks. I went away. I did what the cynic did without knowing I was a cynic. I went away. Fourth century B.C. Uh, wisdom, I went away. I said, forget this nonsense. Guess what? The nonsense tracked me down. That pretty much eliminated the cynic philosophy, didn't it? Wasn't much pleasurable, so I didn't have the other philosophy. And I can't be very, well, I guess I can be stoic, but I'm still going to get run down. So all the philosophies fail here in the face of reality. And that reality starts to be adjusted for us. And we never think more beyond what we need right now or even that we can't help but focus on what we need right now because we're so oppressed and we just need to. There's certain things we have to do. Again, the system is made and worked against us through the things that we find out are enumerated, some of which are enumerated in the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, your human frailties to start with. But uh, what are they going? What are we saying? Where are we going? The digital age, the Internet of Things, the AI and machine learning and data science conundrum. Who will manage the algorithms? It's something I've been telling you is coming. Now they're question. Now coming out. Who, who manages the algorithm? should tell you this is an artificial system. It's not artificial intelligence. And then the problem that the ones that were supposed to be in control of the algorithms, once handed over to so-called AI, artificial intelligence, the AI may be making up the rules, and you can't get in to see what it is, is your future, such that you won't oppose it correctly. Part of which is your continued utility of it. But again, to me, behind the woodshed, it's the principle of where we, what we see being violated and what we may have to do, what may, that indicates we may have to do, part of which is stop adopting into these foreign things. But and here's the story. Uh, you can hear it's coming. Artificial intelligence and machine learning are being adopted into enterprise at a rapid clip, and adoption is likely to surge in 2019. What comes next is the real business challenge. How will, you, how will we manage technology that we likely don't understand? Now, you need to understand that that's what's coming, and they're setting that up, and it's all going to be automated. My little joke, not-so-joke thing about you crossing through an intersection through a green light, by the time you get to the other side, your phone would be putting out a receipt thanking you for doing business with the city for blowing the yellow light that they got you on camera for actually blowing a red light. And then uh, when they looked in your bank account, they found out you couldn't pay the bill. You instructed your car to go to the sheriff or the local city cop house where they could jail you until you paid up. It's here, folks. In fact, I just saw something going through the Twitter. They got an invention coming through. A police car will show up. It'll be a police car that's AI. It'll make a disposition for you about the law that you violated after being arrested. So you're not going to be a, you're not going to be relieved of the threat of being shot to death by the cop first. That's, they're still giving themselves that, but they're going to stick you in a car now. It does exactly what I told you is coming that they'll be doing it. My so-called joke that I did back in 2009 when I saw six or seven different technologies new on the horizon coming uh, was to tell you that you're going to be in a car and they're going to direct, they'll be taking money right out of your bank account. And if they can't, they'll they'll just send a hellfire down and take you out because you're not part of the, you're the outlier. They caught one of you. And if you don't have enough in your bank account, they're going to tell that car to go to the to the jail. Uh, it's here. And AI is going to be all part of this. AI is going to be part of these programs, which one one part I think it would be cool to have AI actually do law, because I could, I could probably compete with that pretty well. Wouldn't have to worry about some man in a woman in a robe trying to obfuscate what the, what the actual code actually says. I, I could probably deal with that better. But this is the future of what they go on, and you're going to be pushed through this uh, through this system whether or not it's right. 
And who adjusts the algorithms is now your problem. The question is being broached today, actually a couple weeks ago. I'm probably, and years ago, they've done this, the so-called ethicists were looking at this. But it's now in your world. The issue is likely to bubble up in, in the year ahead. A year, folks. They're saying, they're telling us it's happening by 2019. This AI apparently is on the, on the cusp of literally taking over uh, major functions of our lives. And we're going to, we are for a short time going to, well, maybe forever, but if we don't move, we'll be uh, subject to this. There's not going to be much a way uh, to relieve ourselves from some of it. As I told you, the big data is going to be worse. It's not going to be really the government. There will be public-private partnerships that will be developed, which makes the companies, the corporations that operate all this worse on you. And since they've got their their bead on they got your number. They have your number. You're supposed to have their number, but they, you have your number. But it's on the news now, folks. It's the AI. They're asking. They're asking after the fact something they don't understand. They're asking who's going to control these things. And sometimes you're going to have the one who controls the machine knowing. And in the in the more uh, elaborate conditions of obfuscation, they're going to have the machines themselves doing it, uh, which would be kind of an interesting random random numbers generator in some regard. But uh, this is what happens in the future when even the thought of man is taken out. Well, underneath the technocratic view that it is is more efficient, uh, but so here it is. We've got uh, artificial, artificial intelligence that no one understands. Who? Well, the question of who's going to control the algorithm, and then the other problem that well maybe it's just the machine controlling the algorithm. And I'm telling you, all these AI are, are all this all this is is pattern recognition. It's not intelligence. But there's a, I found another article somewhere. I didn't put it in here for you, but. They're at, they're 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 proving it out. They're they're identified. That's the problem with it. One of them. So we can continue to walk with this thing. We can continue to argue the wrong points. We can continue to um, think it's not going to affect us or whatever. Uh, but they're saying next year. And I don't know how many people. See, I don't have them that that much, so I don't know. But you try to deal like with a credit card company when there's a problem. You think it's bad now. You talking to someone in India. Wait till you can't talk with anybody. AI will have it for you. When the pattern recognition I have says you're a sovereign citizen. What's going to be your response? If it's like what I see people generally around the internet, it's the wrong response. You don't understand what they're doing. They don't understand how they've, they've sh pigeonholed you and you didn't figure out how to get out of it by turning it around and identifying how that couldn't be possible on you. In other words, what they've done is they've taken your legitimate actions. This is what I was afraid of was going to happen, and it's here. They take your legitimate actions, and they frame them in an illegitimate function, and then they label you and dismiss you. I don't mean dismiss their case. They dismiss you. And this is what may start to happen here as the, did, the Internet of Things starts to take hold, and it's given a false authority. It becomes a fraud, too. And we can continue to argue about us, how uh, how uh, noble we are, how our standing and all the adjectives of, uh, in front of our um, our existence as man or woman is. It'll be it's all irrelevant, as I keep telling you. You might as well just cut literally cut those words from your from your document. Cut those words from your mind. You're none of those adjectives. And to me, the less you say, the better, and the Easier it is to focus if that's all I am. I'm just this, and I focus on the fraud. I don't have to worry about what's going on. I focus on the fraud of AI. I don't have to worry about it affecting me because it's a fraud up front. It's a false promotion. It's like everything you see going on, but no one's talking to it in this regard. They just complain about the effects. They don't go after, uh, the, yeah, the effects. They don't come after the cause of it. It's the allowance of things that aren't as real. And uh, here is another story again. We're talking about AI becoming your judicial your decisions. Uh, I don't know where I saw that, but at any rate, the cop car shows up and it, uh, the cop who hasn't shot you yet puts data into the car that shows up that they're going to throw you in, and it determines what the charge is going to be, and it determines on your way to, to jail what your process is going to be and how much money they're going to take from your bank account. 
my interesting thing about the picture and the graphic I saw is, well, if you pay the bail, they have to throw you back out. So there's a real problem in that as well. See, this is the thing that's transferred over in bail. There used to be OR. You used to be able to oh, your own recognizance. On your word, you could be released. Again, we now know that it's a big money machine. So you, you aren't even really given that option unless you know to force it. I don't mean on the high crimes, you know, big, big murderous stuff. I'm talking about the light stuff. We don't even understand that. That's how bad the system has gone, and no one said anything about it, to the point where you're going to be arrested by anybody for anything, and a car's going to show up that's going to be uh, the... Well, I don't even know what you're going to call it. I mean, it's going to have an artificial air of authority about it that will determine everything about what's going on in the case. It's almost like in Europe, where they defi the judges decide that to, uh, you're held until they decide you're free. And that's stealthily encroaching upon you. Why? Because you go into the courts and you start looking like something that they want to vilify. Let's say the sovereign citizen, notwithstanding its, its, its improper application, and you're done. Because, why? Because you don't know how to turn that around and show the fraud that that was to evade justice and obstruct justice and to avoid a remedy and a right. That's the coercion part. It's not that you were coerced. It's that they're imposing coercion on you. By defeating your rights, your right to a remedy, by a color of authority. That's coercion. Like I said, get it right. You could care less that this, I'm suffering coercion. They say, fine, you're suffering coercion. So what? Well, you turn around and said they're causing it. Now we have a problem. At least, at least we have a, now, something to say. Why? Because there's a standard in there that says they weren't supposed to do any of that. But anyway, now we move on to we get into the problem of when they, who's going to create the algorithms? Well, here's an interesting non-algorithm algorithm, if you will. Something that I'd like to see uh, us understand a lot better so we don't agree that this is agreeable. And it's another one of these civil rights cases about not buying a gun. It's like artificial intelligence that gets it wrong, and we all agree to that. Oregon Walmart violated civil rights when it refused sale of rifle to 18-year-olds. I thought was that other case, the other case in Oregon. It was, it was a guy that went in and uh, couldn't get a gun, so he sued in three jurisdictions uh, underneath the civil rights provision for an employment act. And I told you I've explained all that. Well, this is another case. It's now a woman who files for a civil rights case in Oregon. And I have to bring this up because this is the way you're, you are accepting the way the system is dragging you all along and the way their agents, their attorneys, were dragging this along to make wrongful acceptances, wrongful invocation of jurisdictions or authorities, to make determinations that are improper on laws and policies that are not applicable. And they get the Second Amendment people to say, good, she got her gun rights. Yeah, it's a civil right. Well, no, it's really not. Not in this context, certainly. And so they get your conformity with it. You buy into this. And all the other people say, oh, well, that was wrong. You're not supposed to have a right. What's happened to the civil rights here? You know, what, how is that right that they have a gun, right of a gun? So they have all the other side flared up. But what they've done is they haven't, you haven't noticed that all the people that say would agree that they, she had the right to buy a gun underneath an employment act, that they've got you all controlled. Uh, you'll agree to the, anything that they have to say. And they're the, totally the improper people uh, or officials to say it. Why is that? Well, again, the Civil Rights is an employment act. It has nothing to do with sales of anything. It has to do with you working for somebody or looking for a job. In Oregon, it's got another list of things that go on to pregnant women and all this other. I talked about all this. So here we have, if, if we have artificial intelligence. Who controls the algorithm on justice? And we just now see someone got the right to buy a gun who's 18 through a Civil Rights Employment Act. And we go, Ray, we've just agreed to a felony. And nobody knows that. And that's the new normal. And that's artificial intelligence. It's programmed currently by the existing system. How much better is it going to be when they still when they get to do this on their own? Without your oversight, they turn it into this best science available through AI. 
So for me, I'm looking, everything I've been telling you on how to address this, people not doing it correctly are buying time for the other side to defeat you in the future. By the time we come with the right answer, it may be too late. Why? Because there won't be anything that you're going to be hooked into that won't be deemed to be a violation when you're not hooked into it. And you'll have nothing to say. So on the surface, I guess you could say, great, the woman, uh, the woman has the right to buy a gun. But it wasn't done correctly. The Oregon, what was it, the Oregon Board of Labor and Industry? What authority has been given to that commission to determine your Second Amendment rights? I've explained, you go to the statutes, they haven't been given that right. There's no delegation of power to that. And then I told you, go look at your contested case law, oh, rules for contested cases. Look very carefully, folks. See, the commission is an administrative body invoked, invoking authority under a certain provision of law that can only do certain things, and the thing they've been given to do to so-called for so-called enforcement is a contested case. It's not a judicial trial. And a contested case gives that authority, that officer, a certain power. And if you look very carefully, it tells you they have the authority on contested case to determine rights after an issuance. Is your Second Amendment rights can to acquire and keep and bear and acquire, which is integrated, an after right subject to contested case? I don't even have to see the authority of the Oregon Labor and Industries Commission to know that they don't have an authority based on their... The only thing they have to do is to go through a contested case provision, the authority they have of which is to determine your rights after something happened. Did, are you listen, is anybody listening closely to what I'm saying about how easy and fast it is to figure this stuff out on how we're being duped and continually on how we will be given what we thought was... These people are saying you have the right to, to buy a gun. Everyone goes, uh, Second Amendment. Ray! And then what was it? It was the improper authority that said that. They don't have the authority to say that. They had no authority to deny it either. But we now have been given that, uh, that whole structure substance. And then tomorrow we'll complain about it. It is, an, is a fascination to me. This is why you, you know we hear it, we hear it all the time jurisdiction 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 absolutely but how fraud vitiates everything why aren't you asserting that why do you think when you go to a court and you talk about you that's more important than the fraud it is a is a miswiring in how we've been shown to approach these things we don't walk in the first thing and say well what authority do you have well, the authority you only have in the black and white is to only do these types of cases. Well, then how come you have a case that's not in that subject matter before you? No one answers that. No one asks that. And even if you had that type of case that was within the subject matter, what rights after the fact are you determining that I didn't have before the fact? You... Am I, again, folks, I guess sometimes I should say, go back and listen to that. Slow it down. Write it down. Write down what I say. If I stop making sense, tell me on an email. I don't, I don't know what else. That is what we're do, we need to do. That's what they're doing against us. We need to answer the question. We don't answer those questions right. We focus on ourselves, on whatever we think we are, beyond just making an assertion that we're not the person in the state. And we try to wax eloquent about all the stuff we are in superiority and difference and, and, and independent of that system, not realizing you're already in that system and it doesn't matter where you stand in the, in the, in the hearings department, they got you. And you miss the point about what that is. They do things like this. They have a pro, an organization and a commission that has no authority over the subject matter deciding the subject matter. And they will get all kinds of people to agree with the outcome that they had no authority to give. Whether I go on their, if I have to go looking and discuss it through looking at their delegated powers, or whether I go through what they were given once they had those powers to do in the court, in the administrative context of a judicial, uh, excuse me, a hearing, that's what they call them, hearing, right? Contested case hearing. 
I can prove either side of that that, that this commission had no authority to determine this. And look what the news is. The media doesn't explain this. The bar doesn't explain this for sure. Their attorneys didn't explain it. The attorney brought this. But they got the win, didn't they? Yeah, they got the win. You didn't. Fixing things that ain't broke, folks. Things that I would have never thought would have been coming to, to, to have to say, I've told you were going to have to be said. Things that you think is common right, common sense, common whatever, general knowledge of just the right stuff to do is not valid anymore. That you'd have to declare this now in the body of law to have the objective basis because you don't realize you actually live in a prison. And the only rights you have is the one that are in the black and white. Understand, they did not discuss the Constitution, the Second Amendment, in the case sitting before a labor commission. They simply looked at an age discrimination, which is not applicable to the right, in a jurisdiction that has nothing to do with any of that because it wasn't an employment consideration. But everybody goes, yay, she has the right to bear, buy arms. I would say acquire. That the basics in society that make us a nice society, people helping people, people encouraging knowledge and, and help for others in keeping ourselves safe from oppression, that that has disappeared and we have these other things coming in that no one responds to has been an amazing one, an amazing thing. Like the theft of who makes the decision over the Second Amendment. What happened to our right to hand people food as in a good Samaritan? Just the good Samaritan, that you have a right to help people, has been attacked over and over. Uh, federal court, First Amendment protects sharing food with homeless people. This is a Florida case that we've heard a 90-year-old guy who has been given food to homeless people did so underneath a provision of their organization, Food Not Bombs, was arrested because the Fort Lauderdale, I think it is, uh, if I get this right, yeah, I think it was, made an ordinance that said you can't give people food. What government are you in that won't allow you to feed people, to help them, whether they're helpless or not? Remember, this country is going down the tubes. A lot of working class people are not doing well. Okay? People miss that one too. But what country are you living in if you think you're free that you can be told you can't help people by feeding them? Has been a question. And apparently at the appellate level it's been resolved. But you know, you see, did you listen to how they had to do it? It wasn't just because you had the right. Because prisoners don't have this right. Free people, well, those that think they're free, don't have this right. Those that ignore the fact they live in a prison don't have this right. They had to find it in the black and white somewhere that's already sitting there. You don't have this right unless your warden gives it to you. Well, the warden gave it to us. But they had to go through the First Amendment to be able to give you this uh, the right to go feed people. But it wasn't because you wanted to feed people and care for them. It was because your entity called Food Not Bombs did so as a political statement. And therefore, under the, fir under the First Amendment, it's protected. Are you listening, folks? You don't have the right to feed people to help them like a good Samaritan. You have to make a, an organization, an entity, that entity with that fake name. It's real for the, for the entity itself, but fake is applied to you. You have to speak politically through that before you have the right, you prisoner. If you can frame your argument to fit that, you get the right. If you don't, you lose. And that's what I've been talking to you about, about using this name you can tell as a fraud. You don't do it and frame it right and persist in the right way, you don't get to use it. When you do, you cause them a bunch of trouble. In this case, you get to feed people. Why? Because I put banners and some tables and I did it every week and I did it through an organization that wasn't a charity, that was a political advocacy that every week we were telling people, Food, not bombs. Now, none of you good Samaritans better do this because it's probably going to put you in the pokey. Maybe get, well, that's enough. But if you couch this in a political 
political expression, this court says you have the right, is both disgusting and, well, good for them because now we get to feed the people if we frame ourselves just right. We put ourselves in the same old, right, a right, the right framed cage for us now protects us from this oppression, doesn't it? No, you're not free men out there. None of you are. They'll claim it, but you're not, you're not doing anything about it. You're not it when you're a subject to the oppression. And that reality is, historically forever, you've been subject. So, con contextually, that's, that's really an oxymoron. We are prisoners. Your overseers, your wardens, are these attorneys who now contort the simple giving of food to people has to be now through a political statement. Now let's look at the politics. Remember that's policy. Polity, policy. Police. You live in a police state. We now know that's actually a military state that's got a spaghetti western front on it that you can't tell it. And the only way you can do that is to go through the political authority the Constitution was provided through the 14th Amendment to the states. That political jurisdiction is the only jurisdiction the Constitution was created under. Go look at it, folks. And that was based in commercial contracts before, so look at what your polity is. Your polity is commerce. The whole thing is set up that way. And if you don't frame what you're doing through that, you're likely, well, there's another way you can do it, but in this case, you don't frame what you're doing through that mouse hole. You don't get to. For all y'all that think you're free, you're not. This case is an example of the prison you live in. I don't care who you say you are. I don't care how, how far in the woods you go, how far you think you're different. You're subject to this power. We are pleased with this ruling. We look forward to continuing our community organizi organizing in Fort Lauderdale. You notice what he says there. We're not here to feed the people. We're going to do our Community organizing now through food for, with our food. A really disgusting case in some regard, as I continue to look at this a bit. But my what came prevalent was you only have the rights you're gave, just like Franklin said. No one under pre, no one. I think everybody certainly underappreciated that, or no one appreciated it fully enough. You can feed people in Florida. But you better say you're doing it for a political reason. Otherwise, you're a criminal. Where, where did we go, folks? Maybe we were never. And I guess that's my other thought. I'll convey that. Again, remember, possibilities and probabilities, categories of, of authority, depending on how you line up all the facts in your, in your, in your purview. Lay up the facts of this case, and you'll find out you're a prisoner. That if, unless you conform yourself or get someone in a, in a black robe to articulate the twist and turn, the atorner that these people are to make it so, you don't have the right. Oh, you can become the 90-year-old guy that gets taken to jail all the time and continue to feed, but you don't have the right. You only have what you've been gave. And what you've been gave is going to be handed over into an AI system coming likely next year. And we don't even have it handled where we can handle it. Is how you're being transformed into the technocratic future. They take you out of your own nature. You don't even know how to defend against it. You get in because it's a good idea. And believe me, if I hadn't said it, I don't I don't want to it's not like I'm condemning all of you all that are doing this. I'm saying if you're going to go down these paths, you better start understanding where you're at with the path that you've taken and do it more correctly. We can't accept a decision out of Oregon to let you buy a gun when it wasn't based in a, a, through a commission that had any authority over a law that had no authority over it, over something they had no right to determine after the fact, because there was no after the fact. We can't accept that. We shouldn't accept that this court comes in and says, well, you get to feed people as long as you make it a political cause, and we can frame it in a political expression context, not just because you want to help people and feed them. Oh, no, you can't do that. 
what reality are you in? Take those facts. What place are you in that that's, that's the condition? You need to really look at that. Take, throw away all the excuses and look right at that. And just come up with an answer for yourself. And then you better put that over there in that category and possibility. When you have seen these facts, that's what you're in. And it's probably and likely not a very nice thing you're looking at. Remember, someone made the decision to allow the 90-year-old guy to stop being arrested for feeding people that he now knows to frame in the context of a political statement advancing his organization, his legal entity, having a different name. Do, is, I hope you're realizing this on your own, but if you're not, I want you to realize this is what's been going on for hundreds of years now, actually. It's the problem I have with a lot of people that don't like what they see and will just start criticizing it without stepping back and saying, wait a minute now, we, we live in this system that's the prison. We live in this occupied territory. We live in this thing. That My whining, my, my acknowledgement of the problem, just whining about it does really, it does nothing. I can't even claim to be who I claim I am in obstruction of it because I'm not. I'm not an obstruction whatsoever. I'm not fighting any fight, let alone a good fight. We are accepting of a lot of things that we ought not to be accepting of. We engage things in ways that we think is good, but I'm just, I've found is not. We accept into these things that are gave to us, just like Franklin said, we gave a republic if we could keep it, and then we didn't keep it. And the way we keep it is not by declaring that we got it or by saying it's there, but by actually enforcing it. And this is where it gets us into the uh, law of the land, the real law of the land, where we talk about land disposal. Because that sets up a whole different parameter. It's not political that way. No. And even though we're in contracts, we're not using contract. Not, not to invoke it. We use the obligations and duties of the contract by the grant to expose the obliga relative obligations and duties between a trustee the grantor and the and the beneficiary, which is also by contract, but we don't use the UCC. But it all looks the same. In fact, there was another discussion we were having that this land law cuts us out of the politics side. Partly why be partly is why the the politics drops because the grant it stops it and it puts it into your private possession that is it to the exclusion of that authority and against the whole world. You start putting force and effect on this, I would hope, and I've said this before, it's not something new, that you'll start to see what I'm saying about being in a different place and being able to, to identify it and then protecting against a fraud that causes an encroachment to that place and focusing on the fraud. we got to get ourselves out of this thing. If you're innocent, then you can't be in relation to anything either. What you can do is be, if I can use the word without getting beat down by somebody who wants to be term specific, you become the victim of it. Now, the question is, do you victimize yourself that way, or do you go ahead and try and turn it around? and understand that the reality of life is that you defend yourself as best as you can, and maybe sometimes that's not going to work. Uh, Cain was able to kill his brother. So we can make excuses, or we can start to look at what we need to do and do it more properly. We can give over to a commission having no authority to make a determination on our rights, uh, or... Or we can say you didn't have the right and call that out and get it to the place where we need to do. We can accept uh, that somebody has a, a decision on that they're going to impose AI on you and who's going to make those determinations, and you're not part of that discussion anyway. But you will be. See, you will be. Why, how, and where? Because you'll plug in. You'll plug right in. doesn't matter where you stand, you're going to be plugged in. Or it will be presumed that you're plugged in. And you can argue all the time that you're not, but they've got you. And unless you start to consider more clearly what I've been suggesting to you has to happen, and at least begin there, we're, as a society, going in the direction planned for us. And as I've said over and over, their plan is our problem. It is will be what you gave. 
not what you have right to do. I mean, I'm just disgusted to hear that this thing had to go through a political interpretation and twisting to feed people that you now know to frame your discussion in that way so you can, then that it was just proper for people to be fed. You have to look at that, folks. I mean, everyone says, oh, you don't have to do it. Yeah, you don't have to do it, but if you don't, who are you that you're not looking at that problem? But you don't have the right to help people unless you gave that right. After brutal brutality and violence against you, after uh, however long, and you finally get it to a place, and then hopefully convince someone to give you that right, which means you didn't have it. Why isn't our nature enough is our problem, because they've made it so it's not. Why we have to focus on our nature instead of saying the crime against that nature is really just a conditioning. That's what I'm talking about here about this identity and this fraud and this name. It's not you. It's against your nature. You don't focus on that. You focus on the violation it is to your nature. It's a fraud. Nothing more than it really needs to be said once you proved it. Now you're just watching to see how many criminals there are in the room. So we can look at some of this natural stuff there's answers in the natural side of it. We have to trust in that. We don't have to discuss it. We just have to put that in our back pocket and know that's who we are, what we're about. That's the environment we live in. And the more in tune we can come with that, likely the better it will be. And so transitioning over from AI artificial and the fabrication of the AI artificial law and legal and our acceptance of that, we have natural things and we come back to that the science finds nature, although it hides the fact that nature has the better answer. Not artificial intelligence, not fabricated egoistic intelligence that look what we see and found, look what we've done, but that it was already there. The intelligence was there already, innate intelligence, not artificial intelligence. Pausing here, folks. Innate intelligence. Do we even use it anymore? Do we even understand it? Uh, do we understand that uh, of us is an innate intelligence? It's running without our even thought. It just runs. And yet, artificial intelligence will come along and exploit that in a commercial sense and or egoistic sense to say, look what we found, look what we've done. A little story pops up. Not the artificial part. What was artificially imposed upon a condition that was already existing. I read this story. Scientists produce E. coli fighting cocktail with commercial prospects. Isn't that the only, only prospect, actually? But they say they create a commercial prospect that, that has soundings toward patent novelty. They create something. A novel cocktail of six lytic bacteriophages in, is providing effective enough against Shiga toxin producing E. coli in broth, milk, and meat in the laboratory to spur commercial interest. So, I'm going to stop right there. Fascinating story. And I think, it, you know, as long as it works, it works. I mean, why not? We need to figure out what, how they're poisoning our food all the time uh, now, and we need to figure out ways to do it that doesn't harm us in, in trying to treat, like we might find an antibiotic would. But they say they produce an E. coli fighting cocktail. Folks, there's another innate knowledge that we have, and if you didn't have it, here's coming. Our body's pretty powerful. I've had an idea. Again, I don't have enough tan tangible features to reach out to find out all this. That uh, Our diets have been destroyed. Our the, the soils have been depleted so that they can't give us the stuff we need. That in our body, we have the capacity to do this. That when I looked at the six uh, lytic bacteriophage, bacteriophages that they made a cocktail of, uh, my mind said, where would they get that from? And likely, wouldn't they get that by looking at nature? And where would those uh, bacteriophages may be in a healthy system, but in our gut? And I looked at this and said, well, I don't know that I'm seeing something that they've created more than they looked at nature and said, what is a healthy system that would get rid of this but our gut? And you know, I look up lytic bacteriophage, and guess what? The human gut contains approximately 10 or 50 microbacteriophages or microfoam themes 
probably the richest concentrations of biological entities on the earth. The gut. So in our innate nature, we have in our healthy body the ability in a in a system, in our gut, the ability to kill the E. coli. The failure of us, of which then means we have a sick society. And the exploitation of this condition in a natural healthy gut to do things is now being applied externally to your food because they are doing the other artificial intelligence applied. We get to make it up as we go, and we're going to tell you that this is what we need to do in commercializing this. I don't know how much you think about this stuff, but there's a theory about us being diminished, and that, uh, again, if we're diminished and we have the gut bacteria to stop E. coli and other things, then maybe we wouldn't need pharma so much either. And maybe, yeah, we might feel a little indigestion, but we wouldn't die from this stuff. This is a system that literally kills these things off. It's already in your health, a healthy gut. But what if you don't have a healthy gut? Maybe they're not there. And so, do we use the artificial intelligence of people to, so giving credit to scientists who create the cocktail? Or we say, wow, maybe it's already in me, and it's been been taken out of me, or I'm now doing something that didn't allow it to flourish. Or I'm taking stuff in that the system once puts in that destroys these things. And maybe why so-called probiotic diets start to work a little bit better, although I have a funny feeling they're limited as well. Another potential trap, but not necessarily so negative if you start getting on the idea. What if the artificial intelligence is this life that we live? Because we didn't return to our innate intelligence. The innate intelligence that would look at a system that comes against you to as a parasite. And we argue about who we are instead of exposing, using these innate intelligences to defeat the invasion against us by these parasites. We call the, the legal system that. Why are we relying on the artificial intelligence we carry around in us today instead of stepping back and saying, wow, you know, this stuff's not working. Why? Finding this oppressor and then saying, okay, that's, let's take another step back now that we see that. That's the causative factor. What are we going to do about that? Instead of regurgitating all kinds of things that you might see left and right, taking the stuff of that system, the waste of that system, the wrongful wrongful treatment of that system, such that you hear that you have the right to buy a gun in a Walmart because of a discrim employment discrimination act. The industry that's parasitically going to feed on all of that as well, that's all wrong. Why do we do that to ourselves? Why do we let scientists come up with things that are actually natural not pointing to how you fortify your body, how you fortify your knowledge, how to fortify your actions within that knowledge to make your life better. No, they use it to exploit it. That we don't start, we don't look at this and stop it. No, we'd rather get into the minutia on arguing these things instead of going to the point and say, Wait, you, this is a natural process that you just happen to find and you happen to apply and that's all that happened here. And instead of taking and putting it on the on the problem out in the field, how about if we start getting everybody healthy enough to have these inside them like they already supposed to have instead of poisoning everybody out of those things? And so in case they start getting this, their body can fix this. They don't die. Why don't we go to our law system? We are on our own selves go to the law system and out the fraud cancer, the toxin of fraud in the system and do it correctly. Instead of trying to say how healthy our body is and how strong it is, and then find out that they're, that doesn't, st just talking about how strong your body is doesn't prove that it is because they just took you down. How do we displace the innate intelligence we have for this artificiality, this matrix that's been set up, this prison that we agree with? In Florida, they should be railing against the fact that they had to, had to force the, force a right to help feed people or people in need through a political expression. 
the people in the United States on the on the discrimination acts. I don't care if you're baking cookies or selling baking and selling cookies or cakes or selling guns. They're wrongly imposing authorities on you that aren't valid in laws. Why aren't you uphol- upholding those laws? Scientists claim to find conditions in uh, the, uh, a cocktail that they actually found in your body and would rather turn that to a commercial interest to stop the things that they're putting in poisons and toxins in your food system instead of turning around saying, this is how you fortify these things in your system in case what, something slips through. Is your commercial reality in your world? This is the political reality. It's partly how one of the things that's underpinning the foundation that caused us to be wrong. It's the very thing that gave Congress the the, the right to, uh, if you will, the power to, to regulate, was its existence. And why I keep telling you the law of the land law causes a chasm for that, and it gives you a place to stand that's not subject to it. As I was talking to my friend about the consistency from one authority and jurisdiction, and we were talking about UCC, common law, and the equity, and then we went to Admiralty and Maritime, and I said, you know... Uh, once you get into the land law and the grants, you can address a you can address a prize takings of your land against the the, the grantor's courts. Why? Because you in that court you're now a neutral in aid of the king. Because if you're not, you're going to be they'll they'll strip you of your boat and your vessel. And they'll they'll kick you on land and they'll find your property on land and they'll strip you of that called forfeiture and seizure. But if I'm a neutral and I don't care about the titles, I just want to make sure that I'm in a place of, of uh, neutrality and or, uh, if you will, immunity, I want, to, I want to take on the character that that jurisdiction recognizes as Im- essentially immune from that point. Not say I'm immune, not confront it that says that you can't touch me. No, the power is there to destroy you. You better fit with inside that and explain within the context of that how that's the case. Why are we using external intelligence instead of our innate intelligence? It's kind of a fascination to me. And I'm not saying I do it all the time. I mean, I, I'm having to learn this myself. So I don't know what you think about me saying this. Like, a, like, I, do, like I do this all right. I, I do what I can. I do as best I can. I keep pressing on it. And I do better. And that I'm doing better means I'm still learning so that I can't possibly know everything. But I know this much that I'm telling you. So now looking ahead at what scientists do, and I don't want to put down science, our investigation of our reality is kind of cool, but it's still just an investigation and a question because we, we aren't the makers of the reality. Well, unless it's artificial, see? When you make an artificial, when you substitute a system for another one you control, you very well can determine what that is. And remember, I've told you that in the states, at least 26 states adopted a Model Business Corporation Act which substituted the permanent laws of the people. Should have been a clue. Should have been a clue. And if it's substituted, those that made the substitution are in absolute control of that, don't you think? If you make the algorithm, you're in absolute control of that, aren't? don't you think? When you make the artificial system, the system you create is the artificial thing that you're in absolute control with, do you think? Well, to the limit of your knowledge. But for your purposes being affected by that, they control it. Why did you let it over into their hands? Why do you allow to hear this stuff? Uh, well, we'll talk about... Uh, Kapurknik and whatever it is, uh, let's just do it. Sacrifice everything. He sacrificed nothing. And Nike's con- consumerism. It, the consumer is, is consumers just do it, folks. And that's all you saw. And that's what's going on. We focus on all that instead of some of these more, I think, a lot more important things. We hand over our authority all the time trying to claim we have it. We're clueless to that point. So what can we anticipate? We're Scientists co-opt nature and claim it as theirs. And there's laws against that for the novelty of things for patents, but the, you've seen the system allows it because it's about the bottom line in commerce. You notice I said last time that this was this cocktail was produced and con, con, uh, isolated because it could, had a commercial interest. Let's extrapolate a little bit on this story. Scientists capture the speed of death as it rages through a cell. Kind of an interesting discussion here about what they've looked at. How the, the people and how our little monkey brains are pretty fun. Uh, how we figured out how to figure this stuff out. How we investigate. It's kind of neat. I really enjoy all this stuff. 
It's when they come out and when they do something with it as we start to worry about now. Never, I never thought about it before, but I don't know why it now becomes part of what's going on, part of how it can impact our life in great adverse ways. For the first time ever, scientists have witnessed death itself moving through a cell and have measured its speed. The revolutionary finding could hold the potential for the future treatment of cancer and Alzheimer's disease. Scientists from the Stanford University School of Medicine witnessed the wave-like motion of cell death and published their groundbreaking findings in the Journal of Science. And the link I'll have you, you have the link to those, you can go read them yourself. The team have found signals that trigger death to travel through cells in a domino-like effect at the rate of 3 micrometers per minute, and micrometer is an equal to one millionth of a meter. The signals trigger apoptosis and a type of cell suicide or programmed cell death. It is the most, it is the most understood form of cell death and is used by the human body to get rid of old or damaged cells. Quote, this work is another example of how nature makes use of these trigger waves things that most biologists have never heard of over and over again. Biochemist James Farrell said, quote, it is a reoccurring theme in cell regulation. I bet we'll start to see it in textbooks soon. So with all the stuff you know, the scientists know about biology, they didn't know this. They don't know about how this innate nature actually works. They just stumble upon it. What I found fascinating is their their discussion of this had to do, well, they use speed, they use trigger, they use wave-like. Right? They use wave and then domino effect as if a wave was traveling and energy was moving. What occurred to me, if we take what the what they what the scientists find that's innate, now in this case something they never knew about, and then we say, what are they going to do to commercialize it? And then we see they make a statement here. You know, oh, it might be able to be used to uh, treat cancer or Alzheimer's. Is that what they came up with, folks? You have the ability to trigger cell death? And the first thing you come up with is cancer and Alzheimer? What of the reverse? What if you could forestall by wave pressure that signal? What if you could inter because you now know it's a wave and it's a signal. What if and you know it's not chemical? And now we get into the body electric. What if I can forestall that wave? Are we on the verge of seeing an artificial imposition of cell death in the fact of reversing it to where you put a field that the signal can't be sent along the cells? That's all they came up with here, is that it can cure, cure cancer and Alzheimer's? I'm speculating. I don't know. But if we now go to body electric, the innate nature of us, the being that we are, and we have people now for the first time seeing a domino effect that is used by the body to kill off cells and replace them naturally, but also would be a trigger that would cause you at the, at, in this terminal event called life, when you terminate, that that response happens universally through the body. What if there was a freak, they find that there's a force, some kind of energy, that they could reverse pressure to stop the way, the anti-wave. In the commercial context, and you know this is where it's going to go, wouldn't that be a fascinating power? given that we take our artificial ignorance, the ignorance, not the artificial, the, the, the innate ignorance, and oppose it artificially on systems that always seems to be wrapped up with some power struggle for either the bottom line or control. When you get to the military side, this has got a terrifying consequences. What have we just maybe noticed here that all the things I've talked about today in the control side that we fail to properly address. 
fail to properly acknowledge in the right way to end the, uh, the violation, where does something like this little statement go? Uh, kind of actually fascinating at one level, but troubling as it seems to be lots of things are anymore. There's this evil spirit, if you will, in the world that tends to gravitate for the, to these things for different reasons than maybe you and I might want to do in Florida when we just wanted to feed people for just for themselves, just for their own good, just because they need it. Now I have to now frame what I'm doing in a political speech. All they have to do is frame this in a commercial advantage. And given the potential for what this might have as far as I can see what they're talking about this is really literally the power of life and death and I'm not so sure I can trust anybody in the world with this kind of a thing that's just been discovered and here we are at the point that has been discovered again it's a fascination at one level just fantastic observation quite terrifying now that we see that we're going to we've given over our lives to other people to decide you only have what you gave. We want to tie ourselves into these digital systems that are going to be controlled by AIs that uh, may or may not have other people controlling those or whatever behind the scenes that are making decisions well outside of what you ever conceived. You know, there's the, the dystopian nightmare coming to, to roost. And we are silent in the proper way against it. I guess it's been my main problem all the time in broadcasting. I just noticed we're, we're responding. We're not responding. First of all, and then when we respond, we, we respond in error for the most part. And for as much as I'm enthusiastic about all y'all that are coming forward that really want to start doing stuff, you guys terrify me. It's not just about having the, the, the spunk to go after this. It's no joke we're in a real war. Where it's no joke that we're in a spaghetti western. There's no joke there's an oppressor out there. They'll tell, and the reason why I know that, and you know that too, you're having to talk to it, and it defeats you about every time you turn around. That that should be self-evident. And I have to ask you at that point, when you see that, what world do you really live in? What is your prison? And it's not good enough just to sit that. Now, what are you going to do about it? And I'm saying, even if you're stuck in a cell, you have the right to make paper. You have a right to continue communication. That might be all you get to do for a, for a long time. Lots of people have done that for a long time, and finally they get themselves out. Just by communicating. Now, we might not quite be close to that, but we're, 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 we're getting there, if nothing else. We're getting to the point where we plug ourselves in. Some artificial intelligence says we have a complaint against you, and we're going to put you somewhere, and you never see anybody. The car drives you over to a place, you know, some uh, some seat, the door opens up, the seat slides into some, some chamber, and then they put some frequency on you to put you in, uh, not death, but suspended animation, don't you think? Pretty fascinating what they th what could be coming out of here. And we're, we're, we're just silent to it all. We're silent to the overseers we, we think we're free from. And we will turn away like, like we have the right to do so. And I wonder even if I say, when I say that, do you really have the right or not? Is that your decision? Well, do you or don't you? guess you could. But then what's your gripe that you have to live underneath it anymore? I, I don't get that, that problem there. You complain, but you won't really step up. You'll make a utopia, but you won't really, really step up. And those that step up, they start, they focus on the wrong things, not, and no judgment. That's just what we do. And we don't really critically think about what we're up against. We don't really conceive of the condition. The, the exquisite prison that we're in, the Matrix, is not a movie. And yet there's still a cause within it. And that's the other thing about that. It takes you moving about it. And they get it caught up, caught up in these virtual conditions with these authorities that no one wants to agree to that are still the authorities and pressuring you. How they get masses of people to do things that are irrelevant to their to the whole thing, but they make but they people buy into it. How they get you focused in different places that are totally off the mark. Again, the breads and circuses of this reality. 
it's not necessarily that even voting locally, I would say, is a problem. It's what they've done to it all that people have allowed, allowed to continue. It's a serious fact that if you can get someone into the structure of the government that we have now that actually is good, those that are good can actually bring about good. They can actually bring that awareness and peace. That's a fact, and that's not a question to me. And to do that, the system and mechanism is that you have to vote them in. There has to be this mechanical thing that goes on. That's a reality. I don't know more to say about that. And it's a fact that you can make good change. But you have to be dedicated to that as well. You have to participate with it. And at some point, when you're in a prison, and there's a group of people making rules, is it better to try and get someone in that's conducive to your set of rules, uh, your, your senses, than it is the, the criminal sense? I think people really need to reconsider uh, greatly. I know it's a fact. You get people that are in good mind about what to do, get in those seats of decision, and good things come up eventually. And I say eventually because there's a momentum in the negative side. You're not going to put any energy, inject any energy into a system to counter it by whining. The whine is too high a frequency. But we can, we can watch people self-destruct well, we can go ahead and use this knowledge about what's going on, watching how people are being deceived and engage in useless discussion and still fulfill the objects of the occupier. We see how the Department of Homeland Security created a deceptive tale of Russia hacking at U.S. voter sites. Now, the U.S. level is a national level. We've been through all the nonsense about, you know, voters don't vote the president in, the electors do. We did all that. Don't have to worry about it. Uh, the fact is that your actually actions local. But what we see here is the whole Department of Homeland Security is in your town right now. It drives the whole thing, actually. That if these people in the seats of that decision are willing to make a de deception about Russian hacking and the government, the Congress, won't con put a control on it, remember, it's the executive branch. You have to ask yourself, what what kind of a government, what state, what reality am I, am I in? And what am I going to really do about it? Now, one thing is I can ignore this, but I have to take cognizance that the Department of Homeland Security, who claims that they're the, the fighters of the war on terror, which was fabricated, which was fabricated, no one calls that out really. They, well, they'll talk about all the problems of it, but they won't really call it out in the proper places, use it as a pretext a pretense, which becomes that felony of extortion or coercion or conversion, depending on how you want to go at that. We have the Department of Homeland Security now being shown to have created this deception. Now becomes your warden. Your warden, this is not to get everyone, oh, no duh thing. No, this is what you, the part of the analysis. If you didn't have a, it's not just an opinion, but the warden is a deceiver. You're in prison, and you want to get out. How are you going to do it? And then you find out, as I did, it doesn't matter how far into the mountains you go, they come and find you. Five eyes nations to force encryption backdoors. We're back to the Internet of Things here, whether you know this or not. The governments of Australia, United States, the United Kingdom, Canada, New Zealand, if you thought the United States went from the Queen, have made the strongest statement yet that they intend to force technology providers to provide lawful access to users' encrypted communications. is actually kind of a neat system, a nice statement. They have to provide uh, um, an incentive for these companies to do this. Now, I don't think that they're not going to resist. The point is, the governments really don't have any power here. They're going to get these companies to buy in to make back doors to all your Internet technologies, I told you. This is doing it on a global level. So you think you're going to do it by the United States, you're going to vote, all this other stuff. And you think the DHS is now, we now see they're the terrorist, as I've been saying over and over and over. We now see they're integrated with the world. And we see that they're, the thing, the construction and control they're doing to bring the AI that I talked about in the beginning, and who's going to control the algorithms, and whether it's going to be controlled by man at all, is now being brought into a, a condition where the governments are going to impose on the manufacturers of the technology you plug into 
to make back doors for them. Can't uh, be a, a future that you really, really, really want. Goldman Sachs about to face does about face on crypto sends markets into free fall was an interesting observation and I tied it in there because if they're making back doors what is your cryptocurrency worth actually what's the security of it this has been one of my main problems with some of this notwithstanding all some other problems but what this story here shows us is got this, the terrorism is the DHS is the is in the globe the T DHS is the is the power and it's make going in league with the other uh, Queen's properties to control on a global scale what essentially is your digital world, your digital life, with all this AI comes through. And it's be, we're being pumped with all this artificial intelligence of the artificial system that we haven't yet learned how to address. The crime against us, as I keep telling you. And we're seeing now the, 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 the dominoes being set up to be knocked down like the cell death wave coming. Uh, this is a kind of an interesting problem. Is Goldman Sachs was never going to buy into this unless they own the blockchain on a certain particular thing. Again, they're getting the people to work out the bugs on what blockchain is, but it won't be applied like that when they when the system of this of this terror this global terror occupier starts to create the functions of its artificialness into you, injecting it into your life as they have you somehow forced to deal with it. Or not, and that's where the power is going to be. This story says that the back daddy of too big to fails, Goldman Sachs continues to play games with our crypto hearts after having just promised us a crypto trading desk last December and then teasing us about it again in May. The big bank now tells the Business Insider that the plan is a no-go. At least this is for now and until whatever regulatory roadblocks are preventing it from moving forward or removed. The manic, depressive crypto market isn't taking the news well. Well, folks, this is what I've been telling you. Uh, you cannot be a de dependent on that system and think you're decentralized. You can't be putting your heart into that condition that you accept, that acceptance is needed. There is going to have to be an absolute separation and a consistency and a trust system. They call it an untrust system. It's not. It's a, not a trustless system. You're going to have to trust something somewhere. They, they, they have a special definition for that, but it's not being bought in by the system, and it wasn't ever planned to be that way. The, the, anytime anybody in crypto is going to have to isolate themselves from that system and stop beating their heart for acceptance. This is what I've been saying over and over. And, it, and you may not be able to even do it because they're building in and going to impose the back doors. And the back doors are your vulnerability to the so to the electrons that they put together that you think is value instead of going to the substance that was innate to us to trade because of our nature, like silver coin. I want you to think about some of this stuff. Stop telling stories. Stop doing the wrong words. Stop trying to prove yourself out. Just go after the fraud and highlight that and make that the record, not what you have to do with it, what the, what the criminal is doing. Thank you for tuning in today. I hope something I said will get us doing something all in the right direction and we can move as the big mass of uh, awareness and educated populace we need to be. Uh, wherever you are, I appreciate what you're doing. And, uh, Grimner, thank you for what you do at reallibertymedia.com. And anybody that's mirroring the broadcast, the, the, the views after the fact here, folks, have been just depleted. I don't know if that's part of the shadow banning or not, but I appreciate whatever you do to promote, like, share, or whatever you do, the broadcast content. And uh, I'll be with you next week. Tech diffs are nature willing. Well, that's another lesson. I hope with today's information you can take it to those that misbehave. From behind the woodshed, leaving his mark on the beast, this is Hal Anthony. Till next time, journey with purpose. up a can of whoop-ass feels like. Son, you just opened a whole case of whoop-ass.